WCF uh, chapter 25 and verse the fourth para that we are studying on the church. And just to recap the previous week, unto this universal visible ch church, Christ has given the ministry oracles, ordinances of God for the gathering and for the perfecting of the saints in this life and to the end of the world. And thus by his own presence and spirit, according to his promise, make them effectual thereunto. Christ has entrusted this worldwide visible church with ministry, revelation or or the preaching of the word and the oracles of God, ordinances of God. And we all know that we have been blessed by writers of the past, by the Puritans and many of the writers. We have been blessed by the teachings of John MacArthur and um, Greg Ellenquist and many others. God has raised up his men everywhere so that the church will be fed. It's a universal church. And yet there is a local body that is there. And his, and his purpose in doing so was to gather and perfect those belonging to him. His purpose was to gather all the sheep and that the sheep might be strengthened and rooted and firmly grounded in Christ in this life and to the end of the world. He makes his pur purpose effective by his own presence and spirit. It is not by us. His purpose is being fulfilled because of his own working in us. It's not our work, but his working in us and the spirit indwelling in us. We need to have that well set in our hearts. Someone was asking a question. Are we, are we like robots? Are we like mission? What can a dead man do to respond to the things of God? What, what can a fallen man do to respond to God? What can he do? No man seeks after God. No man seeks the things of God. No man even seeks a godly fellowship among each other. Unless the Spirit of God causes that to happen in our hearts. <clears throat> and then we come to the fourth. This universal church, the word Catholic basically means universal. This universal church has been, sometime, has been sometimes more and sometimes less visible. And the particular churches which are members thereof are more or less pure according as the doctrine of the gospel is taught and embraced, ordinances administered, and the public worship performed more or less purely in them. This universal church has been sometimes more, sometimes less pure. Even if you look at the church history, the first three centuries of the church, or even we can go to the fourth century, the church was persecuted and the church was on fire. But then we see later on in the fourth century with Constantine, the Roman emperor take, making Christianity the state religion what happened to the church? It became compromised. All kinds of false doctrine entered in. All kinds of false rituals started coming into the church. And the church was no longer a church, but a synagogue of Satan. But God had his remnants all along. 
they were his remnants. He preserved them. And at, at a appointed time, reformation came. The worldwide church has been at times more or less visible in Acts 2.47. It says, praising God and having the favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church such as to be saved. I'm sorry. Uh, Romans 11, 3, 4. The Lord, they have killed thy prophets, dig their, down thine altars. I am left alone. They seek my life. Even, even uh, what do you say? Our Lord Jesus, when he was there, everyone left him and ran away. And Paul is writing here. <clears throat> but what said the answer of the God unto him? This is with regards to Elijah. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men. Who has not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. And mark those words. God is saying, I have reserved to myself. It is not they who kept themselves pure. It was God who caused them to be pure by not bowing down their knees to Baal. Even so then at this present time, also there's a remnant according to the election of grace. There is a remnant that God has kept. And you and I don't know. The Lord knows those who are his and he has kept them. And if it's by grace, it is no more work of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And he has done it all. Uh, Paul says in Timothy. One. I'm sorry. Oh, he tells to the Philippians church, he says, all have left me except Timothy. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, Paul is saying in verse 19, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy as shortly unto you, and I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. And then he verse 20, he says, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally or sincerely care for your state. Because he goes on to say, For all seek their own. What do they say? They seek their own. And all means all. And then he just, he says, not the things that are Christ's. And it is true that we see the church today. They seek the pleasure of themselves. They seek the pleasure of men. They don't Exalt Christ. They don't talk of Christ. They do everything else but for the glory of Christ. It's and we see this happening throughout the church. Revelation 12. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and score days. And verse 14, and to the woman was given two wings of, an e of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place 
where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Jesus said this, they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. Jesus knowing very well, the church will go through trials, tribulations, schisms, and all kinds of ism. He says, gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church of God has been at times more and at, and at times less visible or less known. Because someone is very popular does not make him anointed of God. The true, true church of God has always been persecuted and very small in number. And the particular, the local church, which are members of the universal church are sometimes more or less pure depending on how the gospel is preached and received. If the church does not preach the gospel at all, it is no church. It's a club. As I always said, the church is the custodian of the gospel. The gospel has to be preached. The gospel is the food for the sheep. The sheep need to hear the gospel constantly. The gospel is the only source of comfort. The gospel is only the strength. And also, how are the ordinances ministered? How are the ordinances given and administered? That is very important. And the public worship conducted by them. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Your glory is not good. Know you not that a little leaven, leaven up the whole lump. And basically, it is more of a hero culture that we are seeing in the churches today. Verse 7. Purge out that leaven, that old leaven, or remove that old lump. Those who glory in themselves, remove them. That you may be a new lump. That newness comes only through Christ, not through men. As you are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. That is a one-line gospel. Even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Turn with me to 1 Timothy. Chapter 2. He talks of what we should do in public when we all gather together. He says, First of all, we need to make supplication and prayers and intercession and giving thanks for all men. And then he says in verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without draught, 
and doubting. And elsewhere in Peter, he says, if men are not at peace with their husband, their prayers will not be heard. So in other words, they have to lead the homes so that the prayers will be heard. And then in verse 9, he talks, a woman cannot be a leader or run a church or be a pastor or a prophetess. God has ordained his church how he should run it. It is according to his instruction, not according to what you and I think. The church has to be kept pure at all times. But still, we, the church is made up of fallen men who are looking to Christ who will enable them to walk firmly. Of late, we have been hearing many, many celebrity pastors leaving the faith. Number five. The purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture and error. And so, and some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, there, will, there shall always a church, be a church on earth to worship God according to his will. That's a promise of God. That there will always be a church to worship God according to his will. The church is never totally pure. The church, is, even the purest churches on earth are subject to mixtures and errors. Number one, we ourselves are growing in grace and knowledge of Christ. We ourselves are constantly having our minds renewed. We we ourselves are constantly learning that there's some garbage in us and that has to be removed. None of us can ever come and say, I've known Christ totally and perfectly. We are still growing in the knowledge of Christ. We are still growing. That's why we need the gospel constantly. As long as I am in my fallen flesh. We are longing for that day when we shall see Christ. Then we shall be like him, impeccable. One Corinthians thirteen twelve. He says, Paul is saying, for we see through that, let me go, go to verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, and that which is in part shall be done away. And what is that perfect? Let's look at it a little later. That, that means we are still in a stage of imperfection. Verse 11, when I was a child, I speak as a child. And Paul is talking of the infancy of the church and the infancy of all of us. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, what did I do? I put away childish things. Keep a finger there and then 
done with me to Ephesians. Chapter 4, verse 12. For the perfect, the church is gathered together for what? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith. That is our goal. That we all come in that unity of faith, of one faith. One Lord, one God, one salvation, one baptism. And the knowledge of the Son of God. And then he says, unto a matured man. It's not a single person who's going to become a matured man, but we all together. Come back to 1 Corinthians 13, 12. So he says, for now we see through a glass. A mirror, like a review mirror that you see. A dimly glass. It's dim. But then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am also known? When will you when will you see him face to face? Either when he comes or when you die. Then you will know it fully. Now you know only in part, you know only dimly. We are groping in darkness. Matthew 13. And that's why you have so many denominations in the world. Why have denominations come? Basically based on two things. Denominations have come forward because based on the charisma of a man or based on one verse or one set of ideas or, or doctrine and they major on it. Matthew 13. This is the parable of the so soil and and then verse 24 to 30. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade <coughs> or when the grain was sprung up and brought forth fruit. Then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then had it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? Verse 29. He said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. It is like God telling, let both grow together. And isn't this where if both have to grow together, isn't the tares also getting the same amount of fertilizer, same amount of rain? And, and this is a good passage to, to study along with Matthew 5.44. That the rain falls on the good and the evil. And then he says, in times of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather 
you together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barns. Keep a finger there and turn with, with me to Genesis chapter 15. When, when God is talking to Abraham, he, when he is saying, <clears throat> fear not Abraham, I'm your shield and your exceeding reward. And then he says, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. This land is going to, I'm going to bless you like the stars of, in the sky and in the heavens and the sand and the sea. And then he also tells them, I'm going to take them into, uh, into captivity and I will bring them back into the promised land. In verse 16, 15, thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a, in, a, in a good old age. And then he says in 16, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. They'll come to this promised land. The land of Canaan again. And then look at these words. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Their iniquities has not yet been full. So I'm waiting for the cup to become full. Then I will bring judgment on them. The Amorites were ruling the land of Canaan. And it took them 400 years for them to become fully wicked. Did they not enjoy all the good things of life? Absolutely. And the hardness of heart had set in there. It is so true. Here also, the tares, God says, allow the tares to grow with the wheat. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> Let me read from verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And not laying hands, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Underline those words, not laying the foundation of repentance from dead works. He says, let us press on to maturity. And what is that maturity? That you put aside dead works. You put aside things that you depend on yourself. Dead works is your own righteousness. Dead works is your own ways of keeping laws. Dead works is your own sanctification. The sanctification that is not caused by the Spirit of God. And of faith towards God. And then he says, of baptism, of laying on hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. This we will do if God permits. But verse 4. For it is impossible for them who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Isn't this these people that there's who get all the attention of the farmers, just as much as the wheat gets it. They are plowed, they are pruned, they are fertilized, they are watered. But they are tears. They cannot be wheat at all. The same is true with these people. They think they were enlightened. They have tasted the heavenly gift because the sheep, while the sheep is being fed, the goats are there. 
and the goods will say amen to everything. Verse 5, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they fall away, the sheep will never fall away. But the goats are never a sheep. To renew them to repentance, seeing that they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. It is impossible for such people. In Acts 20, Paul is living, saying farewell to the church at Ephesus after three years. And then <coughs> he was feeding this church for three years and he says, I am free from your blood. I've fed you. I've taught you the whole counsel of God. And then he says in verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourself and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overshares to feed the sheep of God, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For this, for I know this, after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Where are the grievous wolves? Verse 30. Also of your own selves, men shall arise. The grievous wolves will come and men from your own self will arise. They are the tears that is already there in the church. That's why the shepherd has to have the staff and the rod. And both culminate in one message, the gospel. The gospel acts as a staff and the gospel acts as a rod. The gospel offends the tears. The gospel offends the Wolves, the gospel offends the goats. The church of God. Many a times. Becomes. Impure. I was just looking, thinking of. The Metropolitan Tabernacle, which was started by John Gill, Benjamin Keach, I'm sorry, and then John Gill and then Spurgeon. And then in the long history of the church, you have many Armenians. And there was one who was almost like an Arius. Who did not believe in the deity of Christ and he, God in his sovereign grace, kept him hardly for a week. The church meanders true. Truth and lies. It has to constantly fight against it. Some churches have declined so much that they can hardly be called the churches of God. And let me add something here. The word church comes from the word kirke or that which belongs to Christ, that which belongs to God. It was a, this phrase, that which belongs to God, was given to a temple. And, uh, and when Constantine became the Roman uh, emperor and Christianity became the state religion, he says, okay, the church belongs to God. 
and he borrowed that phrase from the temple. And William Tyndale, the first translator of the English Bible, he used the word church only twice in his translation. And he used it with regards to the church being, having idols in it. And if we have to go by the definition of William Tyndale, then the Roman Catholic can be called the church. But the true church of Christ is always called as the called out ones. The ones who have been called out by him. William Tyndale always translated. When it came to Ecclesia, he translated it as assembly of congregation. The people of God gathering together. And when the gospel is not preached, you cannot call it a church. When the, or if I can say, when the doctrine of justification is not preached, that is not a church at all, as Martin Luther said. If you are talking of law, you are no better than Islam or Judaism. They also speak of law. And of good things. The centrality of the church is Christ alone. And Christ is the very focus. If all of scriptures is talking of Christ, we also should be so focused on Christ alone. We cannot be man-centered. If we are here just to entertain people, you can as well as attend a, a concert of Michael Jackson or, or whoever it is, or go to a pub. And it has become a congregation of Satan. Or as Revelation, it says, a synagogue of Satan. We are all called to look after the church. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 14. It's another place where it talks of <clears throat> the church and the things that have to be done in the church. And then <clears throat> verse 26, how is it then brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a song, a doctrine, a tongue, a revelation, and an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. And then come to verse 29. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. Why are people always say, oh, you shall not judge the preacher. But the scripture calls us to judge the preacher whether what he is saying is according to the scriptures. 1 John chapter 4, it says, 
test every spirit, whether they are of God. And how do you test them? Is by what they speak. How do you judge them? If you do not know the doctrine, how will you judge them, whether they are of the truth or, or of the lie? If you are in darkness, you can never see the light. But praise God for one thing. There will always be a church on earth to worship God according to his will. It can be from the smallest number of two or three. Though that context is taken with regards to the discipline, church discipline, but then God says, I'm in your midst. And why is it two or three? If you go to Deuteronomy, if you bring any accusation and, and with anyone, there should be two or three witnesses. And if the church has degenerated to the extent of being a synagogue of Satan, and if these two men or three of them stand up and say the false is being taught, they may be thrown out of the church. And God says, I'm with you. Churches have become a kind of a jatra where you have the festival like Easter, Good Friday, Harvest Festival, and whatnot, Christmas celebration. It has become a source of entertainment to feed the flesh. But the church of God, whom Christ has kept pure for himself, is small and invisible. Praise God for that because Christ keeps his people and Christ keeps his church, his bride. He preserves it. He gave his own blood to purchase his church and he will keep it and he will come again for her. What a savior we have. We are waiting for that day when he comes. And may our prayer be, Lord, come quickly. And may we all be responsible to know what we need to hold on to, the gospel of Christ.